in the discussion, and then we'll finally end with the conclusion. Jumping right off into the background here, plastic pollution is an ever-growing threat facing all species. The United Nations Environmental Program has it listed as a critical problem up there with the likes of global warming. Plastic accounts for about 80% of the waste found on land, shorelines, the ocean surface, and the ocean's floor. Environmental plastic waste exists in even extremely remote environments, such as the Arctic Sea, the Antarctic Sea, the Sonoran Desert, and even the deepest point on Earth, the Mariana Trench. Now, the persistence of plastic was highlighted when an albatross's stomach was found to contain plastic originating from a World War II seaplane shot down off the coast of Japan over 60 years before and almost 10,000 kilometers away. Computer, monitor, computer models reconstructed the Odyssey and found the plastic likely spent over a decade in the western garbage patch before drifting over to the eastern garbage patch where it remained in circulation until the albatross consumed it. Now, plastic persists for so long and propagates to these remote places, becoming a problem to the environment for the same reasons that they are so useful to us. Plastic is lightweight, durable, easy to produce, and most plastic is buoyant. Unfortunately, those same properties also mean that plastic biodegrades very slowly and is only subject to abrasion and ultraviolet or sunlight degradation. Now, this is where microplastics come in. Microplastics are plastic pieces smaller than five millimeters, which makes them quite dangerous because of their near invisibility to the naked eye. They're categorized into two types, primary and secondary. Primary microplastics are manufactured to be small, such as industrial pellets, microbeads, and soaps and cosmetics and other various things. Secondary microplastics are particles that have degraded from larger plastic items like plastic bags, six pack rings, plastic bottles, the list goes on. And these secondary microplastics enter the environment through litter, littering, water runoff, and wastewater treatment outfalls as those treatment facilities do not have the necessary equipment to remove all of the microplastics. And because of their very small size, microplastics can easily be taken up by a range of organisms, starting with zooplankton all the way up to marine birds. A big danger of these microplastics is that they can act as vectors for harmful chemicals known as persistent organic pollutants, or POPs for short. And the microplastics transport those chemicals into the food web with the potential to bioaccumulate within individuals and biomagnify in higher trophic levels. The most commonly encountered POPs are pesticides, such as DDT, which I will touch on briefly in a moment, industrial chemicals, polychlorinated biphenyls or PCB, as well as some unintentional byproducts of many industrial processes commonly known as dioxins. Now, this chart highlights what happens to plastic in the ocean and just how secondary microplastics are created. At the top here, it shows how UV degradation and abrasion or mechanical degradation acts to fragment and degrade the larger floating macroplastic pieces into smaller and smaller pieces called microplastics. As we've seen, marine birds are at a partic particular risk of ingesting microplastics because many of them feed on prey at the ocean surface where buoyant plastic pieces commonly accumulate. Once ingested, plastics can physically damage the gastrointestinal tract of birds and can even cause starvation in large quantities, as you can see in the picture on the right with that poor albatross. Seabirds have been shown to ingest and assimilate the harmful POPs from plastic sources into their body tissues. And once assimilated, microplastics and their associated POPs can reduce body condition, alter reproduction rates, and increase mortality in seabirds. Now the four seabird species in this study are the brown pelican, the laughing gull, the royal tern, and the double crested cormorant. Most of these species do seasonally migrate and have quite extensive ranges, but all are commonly found along the Florida coastline year round. These species are generalists, 
meaning they will eat whatever they can find, but they mostly forage for prey on or near the ocean surface, including fish, invertebrates, and even some insects. All are currently classified as least concern by the IUCN, but that was not always the case as brown pelicans and cormorants were threatened to near extinction in the 70s due to eggshell thinning caused by the pesticide DDT, which has since been banned, thankfully, but remains an associated POP to microplastics. Previous work has shown seabirds to commonly ingest microplastics. And though microplastic pollution has gained awareness over the last 50 years, there is still much work to be done, especially considering the lack of data on microplastics in seabirds. As such, there are currently no quantitative studies on microplastic ingestion in seabirds of the Florida coastline. And this study aims to provide data for that deficit and to help us understand just how common plastic is in the environment, both on a macro and micro scale. The first goal of this study was to determine if there were differences in the types in terms of size, shape, and color of microplastics ingested. And the second goal was to discern if there are differences in the rates of occurrence for microplastic ingestion between species. Moving along to the methods here. All birds were collect, collected opportunistically from two wildlife rehabilitation centers, the Florida Keys Wild Bird Center and the South Florida Wildlife Center. They were collected with the following permits. 44 birds in total were collected and processed, 13 laughing gulls, 12 brown pelicans, 10 double-crested cormorants, and nine royal terns. Upon their arrival at NSU, each bird was prepared by being assigned a unique identification number and then placed in a laboratory freezer until processing. At least two days before dissection, the specimens were removed from the freezer and placed in a laboratory refrigerator for thawing, but you didn't want to wait too much longer because the birds would get stinky quickly. Standard morphometric measurements were taken as demonstrated in the chart below, weight, wing cord length, tarsus length, and cause of death if it was identifiable. After that, the proventriculus and gizzard or the avian stomach as well as the intestines were dissected out and any macroscopic pieces of plastic or other debris was removed. As you can see in the picture on the right with the arrow pointing to a fishing hook and line I found protruding out of this brown pelican stomach. After that, those dissected organs were immersed in a potassium hydroxide solution at a three to one potassium hydroxide to organ volume ratio and kept at room temperature for th two to three weeks to allow the organic matter to dissolve completely. All specimens during the dissolution process were kept in glass mason jars sealed with aluminum foil. And a quick side note, when determining what solution was best for dissolving this organic matter, Dr. Kerstetter and I went down some body disposal rabbit holes on the internet and now could potentially be placed on some lists for the amount of potassium hydroxide we needed to acquire. I haven't gotten any calls yet, but I'll keep you guys updated. A total of the 14 higher fat specimens, usually brown pelican and double crested cormorant, did not dissolve completely with potassium hydroxide alone, even when additional solution was added. As you can see in the picture on the left with that very thick undissolved fat layer. So this necessitated a trial and error process of adding additional solvents and emulsifiers to dissolve these thick fat layers. Dawn dish soap, professional strength degreaser, and 100% acetone were added sequentially to try and break up the fat, all to no avail. Finally, the industrial strength degreaser solvoline succeeded. And it took about 15 to 20% solvoline per total specimen volume and more than one day on a hot stir plate to emulsify the fat into small enough particles to pass through the filter. Solvoline was added in 10 milliliter increments until all fat was visually dissolved. And all additional liquids, including the solvoline, were verified by the manufacturers to not dissolve or affect plastics in any way. Once completely dissolved, the remaining liquid was subjected to a vacuum filtration using a Buckner funnel paired with a vacuum flask. It was vacuumed through a filter with a one micrometer pore size to ensure all particles were filtered out and to acquire those very small pieces. 
After passing all of the dissolved solution for each specimen through the filter, filters were kept in covered Petri dishes and left to dry for at least 48 hours before microscopic visual examination. One procedural blank of filter deionized water was ran through the filter for microscopic examination as well. All filters were examined under a dissecting microscope at two times power and photos were taken of every identified microplastic item. Microplastics were identified following a microplastic identification guide from the Marine and Environmental Research Institute. Every particle for each specimen of all four species was categorized by their size, color, and shape. Size was determined by the length of the microplastic at its longest side. Color classified as light, mid, or dark, and shape as fiber or fragment. Our studio was used for all statistical analyses. Standard descriptive statistics were used to describe the morphometric data for all bird specimens, as well as the size in millimeters of all the microplastics found. For the first research question, a Kruskal Wallace test was used to evaluate differences between species and size of ingested microplastics. And two negative binomial tests were used to evaluate differences in the shape and colors of microplastics. For the second research question, a negative binomial test was also used, this time to evaluate differences in the rates of microplastic ingestion between species. Now we're moving along to the results in the discussion. So the brown pelican ranked in as the largest species of this study for all morphometric measurements, followed by cormorants, then the laughing gulls, and finally the terns. All species fell well within their expected ranges, Unfortunately, I did not discover the largest laughing gull the world has ever seen, so I guess I'll just have to keep looking myself. Moving on to the microplastic data results, a total of 643 microplastic particles was found across all specimens for an average of 14.6 particles per bird. 43 of the 44 study specimens contain microplastics for a 97.7% frequency. The mean length of my particles was 1.145 millimeters, the median 0.74, and 95% of the particles I found were smaller than three millimeters. The histogram on the right just shows the size breakdown of all of the microplastics found, and the green dashed line represents the mean length for the particles. So again, the first research question was, are different types of microplastics in terms of their size, shape, and color ingested in different species. Started off by looking at size. As I said, a non-parametric Kruskal Wallace test was used to see if the size of the microplastics is consistent between species. And it was found that no, there is not a significant difference between the size of microplastics and species. In other words, all species contained similarly sized microplastics and no species ingested significantly larger or smaller particles than any of the others. Next up, I looked at the differences in the shape of the microplastics, so fragment versus fiber, and a negative binomial test was used here, and it was found that fiber was the shape more frequently ingested as shown in the figure, with it being broken down into fiber and fragment, fiber being the aqua color, fragment being the purple, and it's broken down by each species. The fiber shape accounted for 72% of the particles I found and fragment accounted for the remaining 28%. Finally, looking at differences in colors classified again as light, mid or dark, a negative binomial test was used here as well. And it was found that the mid color was the only color to have a significant effect on total number of microplastics and was the only color to be significantly different than the other two. In other words, the mid color was ingested significantly more than the other two, and it accounted for 60% of the particles found, followed by dark at 21%, and finally light at 19%, as you can see in this figure here. This is just a brief sum up of what I, what I found for the first research question before I kind of dive into the discussion of those results. In terms of size, all species ingested similarly sized microplastics, the fiber shape and mid color dominated my results. So now if we compare my size results with other similar avian microplastic studies, we find that they are on the same order of magnitude across all of the studies. 
So that, that comparably small size of our particles and the significantly similar size across the four species found in mine suggests that these birds are not directly ingesting microplastics. In other words, the birds are not mistaking them for prey and must be indirectly ingesting them another way. Zhao et al. in 2016 suggested three possible routes of indirect ingestion. One potential route could be accidental ingestion while foraging for food, and another could be fragmentation of macroplastic particles in the GI tract of living birds. And finally, via secondary ingestion for carnivorous birds like one studied here, and this third assertion seems most likely for the results of this study, as we'll see in a few slides. But before we get there, I just wanted to show you how my shape results, the large pie chart on the left, compares to those other studies I mentioned previously, and specifically how fiber, again, depicted as aqua blue color here, was always the most abundant shape found across all of the studies. Now, fibers dominate these results because fibers dominate the production market. Fibers are used frequently in furniture, clothing, and hygiene products. Global fiber production reached 111 million metric tons in 2019, with polyester fibers accounting for over half of that total. So that's almost 60 million metric tons in 2019 alone. And fragments, though less common, are still just as dangerous to animal life. Now we're comparing how my color results stack up against those other studies. And as you can see, the mid or blue color was the most abundant found in all of them. This is likely caused by a few reasons. One, they're easy detection against a low color background like a white filter paper. Two, high frequency in the environment or lower trophic organisms mistaking them for food. Now, the second research question was, do different rates of microplastic ingestion exist for different species? In other words, does one species ingest significantly more microplastic particles than another? Negative binomial test was used here as well. And it was found that, yes, there were significant differences in the rates of occurrence for microplastic ingestion between species. As you can see here, brown pelicans contain significantly more microplastics than the other three species. The average number of microplastic particles for each species is listed at the bottom. Brown pelicans, like I said, have the highest average at 29.9, and the remaining three species have an, had an average of no more than 10 particles per bird. So brown pelicans are the largest species of this study, so they eat more total prey than the other three, which means it is logical to attribute the high microplastic content found here to biomagnification. Biomagnification is a sequence of processes by which higher concentrations of a substance are attained in organisms at higher trophic levels, like the brown pelican. The brown pelican's diet consists mostly of menhaden, mullet, silver sides, and herring, so just various surface schooling fish. Now, Manhattan gastrointestinal tracts have been found to contain microplastics, and one study found that in mullet, microplastics can pass from the GI tract to the liver where, where they are retained. So two of the common prey species for brown pelicans have been shown to contain microplastics, suggesting the significantly higher microplastics in brown pelicans found in this study could be attributed to secondary ingestion, could also be attributed to secondary ingestion. And upon dissection of this brown pelican specimen pictured here, a prey fish, most likely a mullet, though it was hard to see, was found in the bird's stomach and could itself contain some microplastic particles, but this was not specifically tested. Furthermore, tertiary ingestion may also contribute to the high particle numbers as both mullet and menhaden feed on zooplankton, which has also been found to ingest microplastics. Now this chart is just a visual explanation of the last two slides and how secondary and tertiary ingestion contribute to biomagnification. So the concentration of a substance, in this case microplastics, progressively increases in higher trophic level organisms like the brown pelican because their prey, the mullet and menhaden, and the prey of their prey, zooplankton, all ingest that substance. All four study species here are likely subject to microplastic biomagnification in one way or another, 
I think it is just the most pronounced in brown pelicans because they are the largest of the four. So they eat more prey items than the other three and thus have a higher chance of encountering microplastics in their prey. There are no published studies that I could find that have specifically explored a relationship between microplastics and biomagnification in brown pelicans, but it could be an avenue for further research. Moving along to my conclusions. So this is the first study of its kind to quantify microplastics in this way in these four seabirds. Ultimately, almost 98% of my specimens contained a total of 643 microplastic particles. Fiber was the most abundant shape and mid the most abundant color found. Brown pelicans ingested significantly more microplastics than any of the other three species. And this could be due to their highly carnivorous diet and potential for microplastics to increase in concentration via biomagnification up to their high trophic level. But more studies should be conducted assessing this explanation before any solid conclusions can be drawn. My study did have some limitations. One being that the blank filter did produce some microplastic particles despite following all precautions suggested by other microplastic studies to prevent contamination. One possible explanation for this is that microplastics are even found in the air we breathe in both indoor and outdoor environments and could contribute to the microplastics found on this blank. As I said, the birds in this study were collected opportunistically so they do not represent a true random sample of all normal or healthy birds that live full lives in the wild. But to have a true random sample, specimens would either have to be captured and euthanized or a new microplastic quantification technique would have to be developed. The microplastic field as a whole is a relatively new field of study as such, significant gaps in knowledge, data, and procedure exist for any study on microplastics, especially on marine birds. So studies like this are imperative to establish some baseline data on the ever-increasing threats posed by plastic pollution. One threat is microplastics association with those persistent organic pollutants, because it is known that plastic can accumulate large amounts of toxic chemicals, and one study has already shown the ability for these plastic-derived chemicals to transfer from the GI tract to biological tissues in birds. Furthermore, all of us have likely already been exposed to microplastics, whether it be through inhalation, eating contaminated food, or even skin absorption but the exact effect they have on humans is not yet understood, which is why it is so important to gather as much microplastic research as we can. All the plastic that has ever been introduced to the environment remains in existence today. And microplastic concentration has consistently increased over the decades as a direct result of plastics persistence and proclivity to fragment. Plastic is projected to persist in the environment for hundreds, if not thousands of years, and will only continue to fragment into progressively smaller and smaller pieces, becoming easier for organisms to ingest, uptake, and potentially biomagnify. This problem will not disappear anytime soon, and more research is needed to understand the full effect plastics have on the world's oceans. And with that, I open up the floor to questions if we're doing that. Uh, I can go first if anybody. <laughs> uh, is there um, a study that is similar to yours that shows pelagic birds uh, with microplastics versus birds that are more shoreline? There. I think there was one that was in the, the Greenland Sea. They did it on little ox, which I don't think is, are truly pelagic birds, but I think they spent a lot more time at sea than the one studied here. I don't, I'm trying to remember what birds were specifically tested in those studies that I used as like comparison. One of them was mostly terrestrial birds and I can't remember what the other species was, but none that I can think of off the top of my head, but I'd have to look deeper into the into the papers. Thank you. Anybody else have questions? 
it's Anita Zavodska, Johnny. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Um, for all of the particles that you found, and I know they were super small, did you have any idea what the sources might have been, which particular containers, types of plastic this might have come from? Any identifiers on any of this? Right. No, unfortunately, no. That We did discuss doing something like that, but that requires... Um, a type of infrared spectroscopy that is expensive and time consuming. And it was kind of outside the scope of the project for me. I know one of my um, ex coworkers and ex NSU students did do that. And she found varying results and it's hard to, it's almost impossible to specifically identify, you know, if this came from, you know, like a Dasani plastic water bottle or a Walmart like shopping bag, you can really only identify it down to the chemical and then use, you know, what, use context clues to figure out what that specific plastic is used for commonly in, you know, production. But none, none that I did here with any of my particles. I still have them. So if someone wants to do that one day, they definitely could. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Any of our class, any questions? I don't have any questions. I have a question, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. It's, I was just wondering, it might not be relevant at all, but what kind of permits did you have to get from uh, the state to do this to do this project? That would be a question for Dr. Kerstetter there. <laughs> I'm uh, happy to take that one. Um, so all birds in the United States are covered under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which is a federal law that prohibits people from possessing birds or bird parts. Um, the, in addition, universities have special permitting processes that they have to go through if the animals are going to be alive when you experiment on them. Uh -huh. uh, fortunately for us, we didn't have to go through that because the specimens were provided for us from the wildlife centers. Uh, and we actually did get special permits from both the federal U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the state Fish and Wa Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission just so we could have the carcasses uh, on hand. So the, the permit process took about six months from start to finish. It was not wow. a quick and easy process. Um, I got my first one back in 2011, and it's a lot easier to simply renew them to, than to get new ones. Oh. Um, but it's definitely something that you would have to keep in mind uh, if you were interested in doing this sort of bird research. I see. Thank you very much. Very welcome. Um, Julie. Oh, yes, uh, Dr. Kerstetter. Yeah, if you wanted to. Uh, uh, present a little something? Okay, yeah, so uh, what I was just going to add here, uh, in addition to Johnny's work on microplastics, uh, we do have a couple of other things uh, that we have going on uh, in our lab. So give me a second. I think I can... Do I need to stop sharing before you start? Yes, yeah. Thank you. Ah, there we go. All right, so uh, we, I started out this project uh, in 2010 um, as kind of an offshoot onto some of our ecosystem work. Uh, we're mainly still a fisheries and fish biology lab uh, that have gotten into uh, the bird world through our interactions with ecological aspects. Um, in particular, a lot of our main research still focuses on this sort of, these sort of questions of trophic ecology. How do these uh, birds fit into this coastal ecosystem? Um, you know, what are they preying on? How does that predation affect uh, population levels of other species? So we actually do a variety of different techniques uh, to assess these sort of questions. Everything from stable isotope biogeochemistry, uh, we've done some projects in collaboration with those on our main campus, as well as the University of North Florida, looking at mercury and heavy metal contaminants. Uh, 
Uh, I'd be happy to talk with somebody in the future about the crazy levels of mercury that we're seeing in some of these birds, as well as arsenic, uh, but also now with microplastics and other pollutants. Um, you know, I, I really, again, want to thank uh, the South Florida Wildlife Center for their willingness to support this work. We actually just got a new $10,000 mini grant to do additional microplastic assessments in these seabirds, as well as, as Johnny was alluding to, looking at a lot of the prey species to see if we could actually quantify that potential bioaccumulation or biomagnification in these microplastics. So uh, we hope to have a student starting on that in August. So uh, fingers crossed about that stuff. Uh, our other main component of seabird research is with a colleague on the main campus that uses endoparasite communities to assess these ecological interactions. So for example, if you can see an adult parasite of X species, but you know that it's larval stage, it has to go through a particular species of crab, you know at some point that bird ate that crab. And so when you scale that up to the numerous species that make up an endoparasite community within a given bird, you can actually find a whole second way to tease out these ecological interactions. Uh, so we've been working with Dr. Planar on that for last seven years now. Um, and we've been doing it not just in the wading birds, but also raptors and night jars now, and even some of the uh, freshwater birds like moorhens and gallinules. So we've got a, a lot of stuff going on. Again, we couldn't do it without the South Florida Wildlife Center and our other partners. So we definitely appreciate that effort. Uh, the other thing that I always try to emphasize is that beyond our basic education for our own students, we also do a lot of outreach. So we love coming and talking with the public uh, at events like this. We've also done presentations at fishing clubs. We do a fair amount actually, well, at least until COVID restrictions kicked into gear, uh, with going to elementary, middle schools, and even high schools uh, to take some of our specimens and to talk about ecological interactions and biological adaptations. Uh, so if any of you know people who might be interested in having us come to talk, we, we would be happy to do so. Uh, it, we also have a booth at the Tortuga Music Festival. So in between concert bands, uh, feel free to stop by in Conservation Village. So again, just a brief uh, explanation of some of the other things we do. And thank you again for your time. Um, can I ask, thank you very much. Um, could we have a copy of the recording, a link to the recording afterwards, please? Yes, it will be posted on the South Florida Wildlife Center's YouTube channel. Thank you, Dr. Kerstetter, for, for that. And uh, thank you so much for, for working with us and uh, definitely making uh, making great use of all these patients we weren't able to save. You know, their, their lives are not in vain through your research and through your students' research. So we definitely appreciate that. Absolutely. Okay, if we don't have any more questions, the video, like I said, will be available on YouTube. I wanna thank everybody for joining, listening, participating, talking. Um, and let's hope, you know, that uh, this lesson kind of helps us guide our choices at the supermarket when it comes to plastics. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you.